All right, I'm on, folks. Welcome, everyone. Hey, I'm on. Good to see you guys. We're going to wait a few more minutes, as usual, until the regulars show up. We usually get over 100. Thank the Lord Jesus. Even if it's one person, he's worthy, right? But just keep praying for me, you know? So by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, you guys can hear me, right? Let me just do this. All right. Okay, good. Yeah, just guys, keep praying. As I stated on my Facebook page, it really is a burden, right, to have to walk in this flesh with all its carnal desires and warring with the flesh and at times just succumbing to it without even putting up a fight. And so, guys, here's what I want you to really pray for one another and me. Here's my prayer request. Apart from the Lord Jesus protecting my children and I, pray that Lord Jesus gives me such power from the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you pray this for everyone. The Holy Spirit gives me such power to die to my flesh, to hate my flesh, to never, never indulge it, to despise it and hate and crucify the flesh and its lusts, and to walk in the life and the power of the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit will give us the discipline, especially me and I need it, to be a man of intense prayer, of worship, of fasting and serving and obeying the Lord Jesus. Right? So keep praying for me in those areas for the glory of Jesus Christ. I need those prayers. Hey, warrior woman, good to see you. It's been a while. I was just watching a video of our road trip, David Wood and Vocab Malone, Adam Coleman, myself. And we were joined by John Meme where we're in New York. I wonder what month that was. That was in July. Even though from two years ago, I've dropped a lot of weight. I used to be around 340. I'm down 250s. I still need to drop a lot more. I got about 50 pounds to go. So pray, ask the Lord Jesus in his mercy to finally get rid of this weight because it's been a burden on me and it affects just my health and my attitude that the Lord Jesus will give me the grace to lose it and keep it off permanently for the glory of Christ. So keep praying for me, guys, because that's one thing that's been a thorn in my side. I used to be an athlete before I got into the faith and I was you know, somewhat muscular. But then I let myself go, and I have struggled with trying to get my health back and lose weight. But glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to Jesus Christ. I've lost 100, but I'm still heavy. Pray I can get rid of the rest by his grace and keep it off until the Lord takes me home. Just so that, you know, I can have a peace of mind, right? So keep praying. Thank you, sister. A warrior woman, thank you. And to the pure, all things are pure. And this sister always sees good in others. So good to see you. I hope you guys have been blessed with these sessions and have been praising the Holy Spirit for using wicked, profitless instruments like myself to glorify Jesus Christ, who is perfect and holy and pure. And we trust the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to truly live the word, to truly obey the word and love the, love the word, right, in Jesus' name. So we're going to wait a few more minutes, uh, and we're going to begin. I'm going to return to my series, Is Jesus the Archangel Michael, part five, maybe tomorrow. Medic, it didn't get to that point. I almost got to the point where I was going to compete, but I didn't want to compete in bodybuilding because I didn't want to do steroids. But it got to the point where you'd have to do steroids if you're going to take it to that level. And here, let me just confess. I love food. So I asked Jesus Christ to put a bit in my mouth so that I don't stuff myself because gluttony is a sin. And also bit, bit in my mouth so I don't gossip, slander, or attack people unrighteously. But let me tell you reason why it's hard for me. Oh, I love pizza. Stuffed pizza, sausage pizza. I love stuffed pizza, Nina. Stop tempting me, sister. Repent and face the east. I'll choose a slice of pizza over a beautiful, godly woman any time of the day. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. Just kidding. By the way, I got coffee. Uh, Staying teeth, right? No, but I'll tell you, listen, and I'm not trying to be a psychologist. I'm not, right? I'm trying to be faithful to Scripture, and I know the Holy Spirit is our healer, and it will heal us for the glory of Christ. But people, when they go through periods of, let's say, sadness or loneliness or depression, will tend to self-medicate. Our first reaction is not to go to Jesus in prayer or worship or study Scripture and ask the Lord to comfort us. Our first reaction is to 
self-medicate and people self-medicate in various ways. The way I self-medicate is eating, stuffing my face and watching movies, specifically comedies. That's how I self-medicate. So unfortunately, the way I medicate myself is by eating. So ask God to heal me so I don't turn to food but turn to him. Other people don't eat. They'll do something else, right? And you know what I'm talking about because all of us, whether we like it or not, we're broken vessels, right? We're broken vessels, and we have various ways of self-medicating. Some starve themselves, say Dennis runs. But ultimately, self-medication doesn't heal anything. You guys know it. If self-medicating would heal us, then we wouldn't keep resorting back to that pattern of self-medication. We'd be healed, right? Servant Girl says, how do you watch movies? Servant Girl, because I'm not always self-medicating. What do you think? I'm self-medicating 90% of the time. And by the way, let me tell you, one of my favorite shows is The Honeymooners. Jackie Gleason, right, who played Ralph Cramden. Honeymooners, which you can watch on YouTube. I love that series. I grew up watching that series. Grew up watching The Three Stooges, right? Abbott and Costello. Hey, Abbott! Yeah, I can't do it. Also, the, the you know, the uh, Marx Brothers, Marx Brothers. I love the Honeymooners because for years, it's like it was a show about my life because I was just as big as Ralph, right? And the, to the moon, Alice. You know, it's amazing. You could not have the Honeymooners today. The way, hold on, the way Ralph spoke to Alice today, it would be politically incorrect. And it wouldn't even last one episode. Isn't it ironic back then? Right? Isn't it ironic back then you can have Ralph threatening to beat up his wife? Can you imagine Ralph Cramden and Alice today? It wouldn't even last one episode. You know what's my least favorite show? In fact, I hate it with a passion. I cannot stand this show. I love Lucy. I know people love Lucille Ball. I could not stand her as a comedian. Right? Right. Yep. Hallelujah. So anyway, couldn't stand I Love Lucy. Boo, frickity All right. Yeah, now you need to repent. Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow I'll return to my series. Is Jesus the Archangel Michael? There are a few things I wanted to discuss because there was someone here the other day who was telling me, how do I deal with 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6? Because the Joe Witness used that to try to refute that Christ is God in the flesh. So I'm going to talk about various things. And one thing I want to invite people to do. We have different branches of Christians that attend these sessions. You have Protestants like myself, Protestants like myself, who subscribe to Sola Scriptura, Sola, Sola Fide. Then you have those Christians who are more what we call liturgical, or what they don't—they would say apostolic churches, where they believe in sacred scripture, sacred tradition, meaning apostolic tradition that's not in scripture but was passed on from the apostles to their successors, and then. You'll find those traditions in the living church and or in the writings of the church fathers, right? And in the case of Roman Catholics, they also have the infallible magisterium, the teaching office of the magisterium, so that when the Pope speaks from the seat of Peter, ex cathedra, or cathedra, sorry, I don't speak Latin, right? Or when he, in union with the bishops and the cardinals, define faith and morals, that's infallible and binding. Now, the Orthodox tradition, I don't know. I know we have Orthodox here. They can correct me. I do think I've been told, because I'm not a scholar of these traditions. I have a hard time understanding the Bible. But I've been told that according to the Orthodox Church, all of the ecumen ecumenical councils, the ecumenical councils, when the church was united, these ecumenical councils were guided by the Spirit and therefore are infallible. But after the schism in 1054, any council after that does not have the authority of the ecumenical councils. 
Am I correct? Am I correct? I don't know. Yeah. The Council in Trent, which is 1546, and it's an exclusively Roman Catholic council, wouldn't be accepted by the Orthodox Church as being ecumenical. Therefore, it's not infallible. But when the church was united, all the councils, all the councils, <clears throat> ecumenical councils, I mean not pro provincial or local councils, the ecumenical councils where the church, when it was united, came together, they would be infallible. In fact, Alan Rule, whom I love dearly, is a brother in the Lord Jesus. He would know, right? Am I correct, Alan? Am I correct in saying that the ecumenical councils would be considered infallible and the Orthodox would agree, whereas you as a Roman Catholic would accept even the infallibility of the Council of Trent, which the Orthodox would not accept because that council was held after the schism. Right? Yes. I just want to make sure I'm accurately representing what people believe. Yes, infallible meaning that the decisions of these ecumenical councils were guided by the Holy Spirit so that their decisions are absolutely correct and there is no margin of error, nada. Otherwise, their decisions could not be binding on the church as a whole if it's possible for these decisions to be mistaken, infallible, right? Just wanted to make sure I'm not misrepresenting. So there are many here who do not subscribe to Sola Scriptura. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to present just one evidence from the Protestant perspective, and I'm not trying to convert you, for your consideration why Protestants accept Sola Scriptura. And you can argue and reject it. That's fine. I, I don't mind healthy discussions and questions. But I do mind if we turn the comment section into a war, right? And we go at it and start slaying each other unmercilessly, right? So I'm just going to give you my reason why I subscribe to Sola Scriptura and what I mean by Sola Scriptura. But it's because I want you to see the Protestant understanding because a lot of people will – Caricature, caric caricaturize the belief of someone else, right? You have Protestants doing that with Orthodox and or Roman Catholics, and then you have Orthodox doing it in regards to Protestants and their beliefs. We all have a tendency, whether intentionally or unintentionally, to misrepresent the belief of the other, right? You, you with me there? I like to be as accurate as possible and as honest as possible representing the position of another, even though, even though I may fail to do so correctly. So today I'm just going to talk about these three issues, if the Lord Jesus wills, and we're going to begin in prayer in a moment. I'm just waiting for a few more faces to show up. The Christian Shema, Sola Scriptura, Justification, and God willing, tomorrow, God, God willing, Lord Jesus willing, as the Lord loosens my tongue to speak without error, without stammering, without confusion, filling me with wisdom and knowledge and power and anointing me from his Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? God willing, tomorrow I will go back to my series, Is Jesus the Archangel Michael? Now, before I do that, I do want to ask you to pray for Zarina Blanchard, precious sister in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Who walks with the Lord Jesus because she's going to be having surgery for her valve, Right, so pray that the Lord Jesus will bless her, that the surgery will be great success. She'll come out more healthier than ever, and that the Lord Jesus will watch over her family, especially her young son, and keep them perfectly healthy, safe, and sound in His love. So pray for our sister; she's here, Zarina, because this is a big surgery, and you know what? I'm sure she has some fears because she's human. Because I don't like to go under the knife. I don't like when they put me under. I don't like to be unconscious. But hey, if we have to, we have to, right? And Rick said something that really touched my heart. 
Lord Jesus, bless Rick and bless every one of you. Every one of you. Lord Jesus, bless every one of you and seal you by his spirit. Bless me and my daughters. I need his blessing. They need it. Rick said that after he heard yesterday's session about the price that the God had paid, he wouldn't stop crying for 30 minutes. And that's exactly the kind of response I want to see in me and others, a response prompted by the Holy Spirit from a genuine, sincere heart, heart cleansed by the blood of Jesus, intentions cleansed by the blood of Jesus, that we just cry tears of love and thankfulness and gratitude for what God did. Father, Son, and Spirit, right? I may do that. Yes, Sunan Abu Dawud on Surat Al-Ikhlas. Ahad. Ahadun. Kul. Huwa Allah. Ahad. Right. And man, I've never cried as much in my life as I have been the past couple of months. And I pray that when I do, it's from the Holy Spirit, from a sincere heart. Right. But that's one reason why I don't like to cry in front of people. Because I don't want people saying, ah, oh, this guy is just putting on a show. Because, you know, you have haters that are going to question your motives. So I trust the Holy Spirit will cleanse our motives in the blood of Jesus. Okay, we're about to begin. Yep. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a one point. Add one point to yesterday's discussion about the Lord Jesus Christ suffering God forsakenness where the Father and the Spirit breaks fellowship. To treat Jesus as a sinner because he dies in our place, right? And I went through the details yesterday. Like I said, not all Christians believe that or accept that particular view or interpretation. They're free to believe what they believe or what they want to believe. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me to understand scriptures correctly and correct me when I'm mistaken and give me the grace to be humble enough to correct myself for the glory of Jesus, right? So, but that's what I believe. I haven't been convinced otherwise, but what I want to do, what I want to do is show you from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ that what he was dreading wasn't the physical beating and being nailed to the cross. What he was dreading, what he was fearing was drinking the cup of God's wrath. Though he is God, he's distinct from the Father and the Spirit. So when I say God's wrath, obviously I'm speaking of the Father. Right? When I say God forsakenness, I'm not saying that Jesus as God forsook himself. I'm talking about the Father and the Spirit because they too are God and treated Jesus as the guilty party, guilty of committing the sins that we did in order to punish him in our place, which he took voluntarily. Right? Is that clear? So keep praying for me to get holier. To be more pure, more holy, more in love with Jesus and obey him, worship him more perfectly and to get my health back and to keep looking good. My goal is to be the best looking Christian apologist in the world. And I'm close because I'm second to none. <laughs> no, all joking aside. Right. If you're ready, I want to pray and we're going to begin. If you're ready, let's pray. We want to say we love you, Father, and we praise you, Father, and we magnify you. We love you. Though we don't love you as we should and we fail you, give us the power of the Holy Spirit not to fail you, but to be in love with you, Father, to be in love with your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, Father, cleanse us in the blood of Jesus. Cleanse us of our moral failures and imperfections, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, especially me, Father, Give me the power to be enslaved to your spirit and to crucify my flesh and destroy the fruits of our flesh, Father. Give us the power to walk in the life of your spirit, the power of your spirit, and to be filled with the fruit of your spirit, Father. And give me the grace. Give us the grace to be self-controlled spiritually, emotionally, and physically, Father. I pray, Father, that you bless this session in the power of your Holy Spirit. Anoint my mouth to speak clearly. Save me from confusion and stammering and from error, Father. And fill us, fill everyone here with wisdom and knowledge from your Holy Spirit and a heart that's humble and teachable to hear from your Spirit, not from me, Father. And cover us with the blood of Jesus. Cover our loved ones, my daughters, with the blood of Jesus. Wash us, wash our loved ones, my daughters, in the blood of Jesus, Father. 
And may Jesus Christ be glorified and give us wisdom and knowledge, understanding to find the depth and the beauty of Scripture, to dig deep and be blown away by your word, which is your voice, because you are real and the Bible is your word and Jesus is alive. And we are filled with your spirit, Father. Bless those who are hurting, Father. Bless those who are struggling. Bless those who are going through trials. And bless our sister Zarina that the surgery will be successful and she'll come out healthier on the other side. And bless her children, Father. And bless my gracious host, Idiotai Apologetics Alex. Watch over him, his family, preserve them and seal them by your spirit. Because of his grace, I'm able to be here and teach your people, Father. Please bless them, Lord, for the sake of your son, the Lord Jesus, whom he loves. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, have your way in this session. Fill my lungs, my throat, my chest with health that I need from you to glorify the name of Christ. And anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants for the sake of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha. By the way, you don't have to pray with your eyes closed. You know that, right? You can pray with your eyes open. I just want you to know that. People have a habit to close their eyes because they don't want to be distracted by what they see. However, in the scriptures, you'll find oftentimes the servants of God looking up to heaven with their hands stretched out. Let me give you an example. Let's go to John 17, verse 1. Right? We're going to begin. My intention in these sessions is not to bore you, but I'm not here necessarily to entertain you. I want to educate you by the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God, right? So pray that I'll be filled with the Spirit to educate you, and you'll fall more in love with Jesus and his word. I don't want to be boring, but that's not the goal. It's not entertainment here. Yeah, hit the like button and subscribe. I'm trying to get over 300,000 subscribers like Hater Wood, right? Come on, help me. John 17, read with me and thank our brother, Protestant believer, for posting and serving me to serve you. Read, guys. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. So notice Jesus didn't pray with his eyes closed here. He lifted up eyes to heaven, looking to the Father, and said, Father, the hours come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Now, Mark 11, 25. So when, I, when you read scripture, I want you to pay attention to the prayer posture. Pay attention to how the men and women of God prayed. You'll see they prayed with their heads to the ground, on their knees, hands up, eyes open. So there are various ways in which they prayed, various prayer postures, right? Mark 11, 25. It's okay, France, you can do that. But watch here, Mark 11, 25. Here's another prayer posture. And when ye stand praying, see now, stand praying. If you have aught against any that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Did you catch it? When ye stand praying. So you can stand when you pray. You can sit when you pray. You can kneel when you pray. You can prostrate your head to the ground when you pray. Or you can look up with your eyes open. Matthew 26, 39. John 3, something asked me that later. I'll try to answer it. Right, Matthew 26, 39. Watch here. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Which now segues into the discussion, the point. Notice our Lord Jesus' prayer. What is he asking the Father to do? He's asking the Father to remove the cup from him, but he's not insisting. He's not saying, you got to remove it. He's saying, if it be possible, take this cup from me, yet not as I will, but your will be done, right? You with me there? Now, let's go to Matthew 14. Read 33 to 38. Let me explain the cup, what Jesus was dreading to confirm what I said yesterday, and we'll go into the Christian Shema or Sola Scriptura. I know people disagree with Sola Scriptura. Don't stone me. You don't accept it. That's fine. I'm going to give you an example, a passage that I believe affirms it, and then you can bring objections. This is where you can bring objections. 
But don't bombard me one at a time, and I'll try to explain my position as best as I can. Matthew, Mark, not Matthew. Mark 14, 33 to 38. If I said Matthew, then it's your fault for not hearing me correctly. If I said Matthew, it's your fault, Protestant believer, because you're not hearing me correctly, even though I said Matthew. Mark 14, 33 to 38. Pray it will be filled with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, knowledge to be blown away by the word of God. Yeah, making fun of me, Holy Tornado, huh? Did you catch it? Brah, what's up, brah? Okay, and he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy and saith unto them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tear ye here and watch. Now notice what our Lord Jesus is praying. Guys, pay attention to what he's, what he's asking the Father to do. And we went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. He even prays perfect prayers. He's careful to say, I'm not insisting you take it away. If it's within your will, will if it's in the realm of your will, take the cup away from me. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto them, unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak, right? Okay. Did you catch what the Lord prayed, right? Did you catch what the Lord prayed? Abba, Father, everything's possible with you. Take this cup away from me, yet not my will, your will be done. What was Jesus dreading? Not the physical scourging, beating, or being nailed on the cross. Because even some of our Lord's martyrs, like Paul, showed more boldness in the face of physical death. To say that Jesus is dreading physical beating and being killed on a cross, whereas his servants after him showed more boldness, would be an insult to the majesty of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It would be an insult to him to suggest that that's what he's fearing, right? What is he dreading? To drink the cup, because now let me show you what the cup is. Psalm 75, verses 7 to 8. Psalm 75, verses 7 to 8. Yes, Angela. But I'm going to confirm it by showing you scripture what the cup refers to. Even if you didn't agree with me, Esperanto God, right? Psalm 75, 7 to 8. Read with me. But God is the judge. He put it down and setteth up another. Now notice verse 8. For in the hand of Jehovah, Yehovah, there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. You see, God has a cup of judgment and wrath that he's going to make the wicked drink to their destruction. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Isaiah 51, 17 to 22. Isaiah 51, 17 to 22. We've got to get it up to 200 soon. Watch here. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of Jehovah the cup of his fury. Did you catch it? The Drunk from the hand of Jehovah the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. There is none to guide her among the sons whom she hath brought forth. Neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she hath brought forth. These two things are come upon thee, come unto thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? Right? <clears throat> Thy sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of Jehovah, the rebuke of thy God. Therefore, hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. So you're drunk, but not with wine. <coughs> Thus saith thy, thy Lord, Jehovah, Yehovah, 
on thy God that pleaded the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. You catch it? What is the cup? The cup of God's wrath and anger poured out upon evildoers as punishment. You see it? Now, this is a long passage. We're not going to read it, but you can write it down. Psalm 25, 15 to 29. Psalm 25, 15 to 29. All right? Send him on his merry way. Psalm 25, 15 to 20. We're not going to look at it. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Not Psalm. Forgive me. It's Jeremiah 25, 15 to 29. I don't know why Psalm came into my mind. Sorry, guys. Lord Jesus, protect me from error. Jeremiah 25, 15 to 29. But we're not going to quote it. Just write down Jeremiah 25, 15 to 29. Right, Because it's a long one, but there it talks about God is going to make all the nations drink the cup of his wrath, the cup of his fury, the cup of his judgment. The final one, Re Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11. Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11, the final one. Okay. Revelation 14, 9 to 11. I don't know why Psalm came into my mind. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, right? Yep. You got to put the uh, – this sometimes – Next up. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Ugh, this, this connection there. Right? Same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. You caught it? Revelation 14, 9 to 11. I don't know why you're quoting 12, 13. I guess you want to give me brownie points. You caught it? What is the cup of God in all these passages? The cup of God is his wrath, his anger, his indignation, his judgment poured out on evildoers. So you understand now what the Lord Jesus was dreading? What was he dreading? Physical death? Exactly, friends, Tuma. That's why I said this view of the crucifixion that I articulated in yesterday's session, which you can listen, means not only was the heart of Jesus broken, decimated, but the hearts of the Father and Spirit were broken and decimated because of the pain and anguish they had to experience and pouring out the divine wrath upon the one they love and adore more than anything. You caught it? So I just wanted to show you what the Lord, right, was dreading. He was not afraid of physical death. That would be an insult to the majesty of our God. He was dreading the reality of having to undergo divine judgment, Drinking the wrath of God to appease the holiness of God as our representative. Experiencing something he had never experienced prior to that moment. Neither the Father nor the Holy Spirit. Right? Some of you guys can't even focus. You guys bring up irrelevant issues. John MacArthur said, is this about John MacArthur and his view about whether you can take the mark of the beast or not? Why is it you Christians can't focus? Wow. And you see what you started? Now you got people talking about John MacArthur can be wrong and still be a, a brother in Christ. Really, folks? Why do you guys get so easily distracted? It's, it's, it's angering to me, honestly. If you're in a movie theater, you will give your undivided attention to a movie on the screen because you don't want to miss out because you paid 20 bucks. How much more should you be focused on the Word of God? Right? 
It's not even disrespectful to me. Forget me. If I was just joking, who cares? It's dishonoring to our God. We're talking about our God who suffered hell on the cross to save us and his word proclaiming it. And you guys want to be distracted? Really? Why are you here? Go somewhere else and debate these issues. Come on, guys. We're not kids. I'm not going to treat you as a kid. You're my brother, sisters in Christ, and you don't have to be here. You're here because you want to hear from the Lord. Then focus. Man, dude, unbelievable. The, the attention span of Christians. No. I mean, come on. Yep. Anyway, I hope you understand now what the Lord was dreading, right? Yeah, I had to throw in that facial expression to lighten up the atmosphere because I know it got really tense when I got angry, right? Like, oh, he's angry again. Is there a day in which he's not angry, right? Okay, anyway. Is that clear what the cup is? Now, let me, uh, this is going to cause controversy. <laughs> and believe me, I don't do it because I want to be controversial, honestly. I don't try to go out of my way to be disliked. In fact, if anything, I need more people to like me because I need love, right? Can you just love me? Can someone give me a hug, right? But I have to deal with these issues because these issues are necessary to discuss because we're called to affirm the truth of God to the best of our ability by the power of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't mean that if I believe something to be true, it is. I may, may be mistaken, I may be mistaken, right? So what's my prayer? Holy Spirit, by your power and your love for us and love for me, for the sake of Jesus, show me where I'm wrong, convict me of my error, and give me the grace to be humble enough to correct my error and give me the power to walk in holiness, right? In Jesus' name. That's my prayer, even though I fail every day. So let me look at a passage that many Orthodox and Roman Catholic believe they have a response to a passage used by Protestants to affirm sola scriptura. Are you ready? Now you can disagree with me. I don't, I'm not here. If you don't believe the Bible teaches it, that's okay, but I'm giving you my reasons and I'll do an in-depth series on it in time. I'm just going to focus on second Timothy two, because the other side thinks this is the weakest argument for sola scriptura. Are you ready? Let me define sola scriptura. Sola scriptura, the Latin slogan means only scripture. Let me explain what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that the Bible alone is the authority for Christians. Because the Bible itself tells us there are various authorities that God has instituted for Christians. For example, you have governmental authority that we are to submit to as long as the government doesn't make us break a command of God. That's in the Bible. The Bible also tells us to honor our parents and submit to their authority. So that's another authority. Also submit to the bishops, the elders of the church. That's another authority. And so on and so forth. You with me there? What Sola Scriptura teaches is that the Bible is the sole infallible rule of faith. Because we all agree the Bible is the voice of God. The inspired word of God. And because it's the inspired word of God, it is free of all errors right? Completely reliable and therefore holds ultimate authority and is an authority over every other authority, right? Are you with me there? So Sola Scriptura does not teach only the Bible is an authority. Let me repeat it again. I know a lot of the, from the other camp, and again, I can't blame them because they're Protestants who don't define what Sola Scriptura is. So they misdefine it. But there are people who say, see, Sola Scriptura means the Bible alone. Well, the Bible alone what? That's an incomplete statement. The Bible alone is infallible. And because it's infallible, being the voice of God, there is no authority equal to God's voice or greater than the voice of God. If the Bible is God's voice, then you can't have an authority equal to the voice of God or greater than the voice of God unless that other authority is also part of God's voice. You hear me there? And this is where the debate comes in. 
The Roman Catholic Orthodox will say, ah, apostolic tradition is also infallible, and it too is part of the voice of God and therefore equal to Scripture. Right? You understand the difference now? I'm going to try to be more educational. I hope it's not boring you. You're still learning and growing by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some days you'll be crying out of passion, love for Jesus, out of brokenness. Some days you'll be laughing out of joy. And some days you'll just be scratching your head like, hmm. As long as we're growing in our knowledge, understanding, and love of God's word and of God himself. Okay? So Sola Scriptura teaches the Bible is the sole infallible, fallible meaning, completely reliable from cover to cover, rule of faith, and holds ultimate authority over every other authority. It is an authority over every other authority. That's the Protestant belief. Catholics don't believe that. The Orthodox doesn't believe it, right? So now that I've defined the term, let me give you a passage that the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox think doesn't prove Sola Scriptura. Are you ready? And I'm inviting the Roman Catholics to give me some objections in a loving manner without attacking me because I'm not here to attack you guys, right? Because I've heard the arguments. I've studied the arguments. I'm not an expert scholar, but I've studied. I know. But I'm going to give you 2 Timothy 3, 14 17. I'm going to unpack it. Okay, are you ready? 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Okay, and... So the King James Version had 80 books. And the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Coptic Church, Ethiopian Orthodox Church has 81. And? Okay, Alan, please give me some objections because you're the man to do it. I know you can. And I love this brother. Let's read. 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Okay, read with, read with me and I'm going to unpack it. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So Paul is exhorting Timothy. You know the people who taught you. They were spiritual guides, moral examples, and they were worthy to be heard and obeyed because they were men and women of God. In the context of Timothy, it's not about his, his, his mother, right? Anyway, let's keep reading. And that from a child, and here's one objection. Get ready for the objections. And that from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. So here... Paul calls the scriptures holy. So if you want to know where you got the word holy Bible from, well, in two places, the scriptures are called holy. Are you with me there? Have you ever wondered why we call the holy Bible the holy Bible? Well, partly because we have Paul in Romans 1. Are you with me? Romans 1 verse 2 and 2 Timothy 3.15 calling the scriptures holy. Where do we get the word Bible from? We get it from the Bible itself, but I'll get into that. I just want you to show. Now here, post Romans 1, verse 2. Romans 1, verse 2. As the Lord Jesus enables me to recall these passages. Romans 1, verse 2. Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So the Old Testament is called holy. Now let's go back to 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. Brother Bas. Yeah, I love you, Brother Bas. Okay. 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. Exactly, Nara. I know you believe that. Orthodox Catholics believe it's holy, it's inspired, it is infallible, but it's not the sole or ultimate authority. That's where we disagree here. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, 16 and 17. Let's unpack it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, the Greek word is theopneustas. Some like to pronounce the P. Theopneustas or theonustas. Literally, God breathed. Literally, God breathed. All scripture is breathed out by God, meaning the scriptures are breathed out by God. He went... And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the scripture not only give you the wisdom necessary to know how to get saved. Notice what 15 said. The scriptures were created with an ability. The ability to make you wise, to give you the wisdom to know how to get saved through faith in Christ Jesus. But the scriptures were also produced to teach you what to believe and how to live, doctrine. 
to correct you when you're wrong, to rebuke you and instruct you in a living righteously, right? That the man of God, the man of God, 17, may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Okay. So you see what the scriptures are given for. The scriptures were produced by the Spirit to give you the wisdom to know how to get saved. And how do you get saved? By faith in Jesus Christ. So if you want to know how to get saved, the scriptures will tell you, trusting in Jesus Christ. All right. Ah, this buffering. Ah, technology. Ah. We are friends, Toma. But we can talk about our disagreements in love. We do have disagreements. We can't ignore them. Right? You want me there? No, no, no. You don't need to delete friends, Toma. He's a brother in Christ. So we can agree to disagree and discuss our differences without condemning each other to hell. So I'm giving you the Protestant perspective. Study it. If I'm wrong, may the Lord show me my error. If I'm right, may he confirm it in the hearts of goodness. There we go. It's buffering. All right. Wow, man. Please, Lord Jesus. Hold on. It's buffering. Is it okay now? Is it okay? All right. I'm scared to talk and it starts buffering. Okay. Notice the scriptures were produced. To make you wise unto salvation. Are you listening to me? So whatever you need to know to be saved is in the scriptures. The scriptures will give you the wisdom to know how to be saved. And salvation comes from believing in Jesus Christ. Verse 15. 16, 17 state the scriptures are also given to teach you doctrine, to reprove you, meaning rebuke you when you need to be rebuked, to correct you when you're mistaken, and to teach you how to live righteously so that you'll be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished for every good work. Okay. Now, one objection given against this passage teaching, teaching Sola Scriptura is that the scriptures that Paul had in mind were the Old Testament scriptures, not the New Testament. Because in 2 Timothy 3.15, and I need you guys to listen. 2 Timothy 3.15, it says... How Timothy has known the Holy Scriptures since childhood. There was no New Testament in his childhood, so he must be referring to the Old Testament, right? So the objection is, this would prove... Oh my God. All right. Okay. Is it okay now? All right. So the objection is, this would prove too much. Why? It proves you don't need the New Testament. All you need is the Old Testament. That's one of the objections I've heard. So what's the objection against using this to prove Sola Scriptura? Really bad today, huh? Really bad today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Please, Lord, help me to get this message across for your glory. Okay. So, okay, all right, fine, let me know. But you understand what the objection is? If this proves Sola Scriptura, it proves too much. It proves all you need is the Old Testament, right? Are you? That's one of the objections level against the use of this passage. Okay, now are you ready for the response? Are you ready for the response? Number one, it is not true. It is not true that Paul is limiting... His statement to the Old Testament. Paul is referring to everything and anything that would be scripture produced by God. Not just the Old Testament. You know how I know that? Paul's statement that all scriptures God breathed is not limited to the Old Testament. Paul has in mind everything and anything up until the point of his writing that is scripture produced by God, not just the Old Testament. You know how I know that? You know how I know that? That he's not limiting it just to the Old Testament? Because of 1 Timothy 5.18. In 1 Timothy 5.18, he cites Moses and the Gospel of Luke and classifies them both as Scripture. 
First Timothy 5, 18. Let's look at it. For the scripture singular saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Pay attention there. Here Paul quotes two passages as scripture. The first, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, is Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. The second, and the laborer is worthy of his reward, is word for word identical to the Greek of Luke 10, 7. Now do me a favor, Protestant believer. Post 1 Timothy 5, 18 with Deuteronomy 25, 4 and Luke 10, 7 back to back. Yep, let me show you. Let me prove it to you guys. Deuteronomy 25, 1 Timothy 5, 18, back to back with Deuteronomy 25, 4 and first, uh, Luke 10, 7. Sorry. Watch here. What's PB? I have no idea what PB is. Yeah, poor guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Prania. Watch here. Don't take my word for it. Read. Eventually in time, love, love light. In time. Watch here, but I want you to read where Paul is quoting from calling scripture. No, Protestant believer, I wanted you to put 1 Timothy 5.18 before the other two passages. Let's try it again, bro. Sorry. 1 Timothy 5.18, Deuteronomy 25.4, Luke 10.7, so they can see it with their own eyes. And the Greek of Luke 10.7 is identical to 1 Timothy 5.18. It's identical. If you read Greek, go check it up. Don't take my word for it. Look at this guy, what he's talking about. Talking about the one who's alive to see the coming of the Lord was John. What does that got to do with my discussion? All right. Uh, just waiting for the brother. Sorry about that. Oh, he left us behind. He's been raptured. All right. Online, Brother Bass. You can do Greek, New Testament, and you read it. Okay, read with me now, guys. Read with me. Read. Guys, read. Don't comment so you can follow the flow of the verses. Read. Okay, I'm waiting for the other two. When you put comments, you separate the verses from each other. Wait. Read and wait. Now read. First Timothy 5.18. For the scripture, singular, saith, all scripture, singular, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now read Deuteronomy 25, 4. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. That's the first citation from Paul. Second, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel of Luke. And in the same way, this is Christ speaking. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. It's the same in the Greek, identical. Reward and hire, same Greek word. Go not from house to house. Did you see what Paul did? He took Moses' writing and the gospel of Luke and combined it together and called it scripture in 1 Timothy 5.18, showing that the apostle Paul recognized the writing of his companion, Luke, who was a Greek, who wasn't a Jew, who was an apostle, as scripture. You see what he did? As scripture. Why is this astonishing? Paul is a Jew, an apostle. Luke is a Greek, his companion. He's not an apostle. But Paul recognizes that what Luke wrote is scripture, and he quotes it along with Moses. No one doubts that Moses is a prophet and his writings are scripture. But he takes Luke's gospel and Moses' writing and together calls it scripture. So in 2 Timothy, when he says all scriptures God breathe, how can you say he's limiting it to the Old Testament when already in his first epistle, he quotes the gospel of Luke as scripture? Exactly medic for Christ. So who told you all scriptures God breathe is limited to the Old Testament? Who told you? When you say in our New Testament, yeah, both together. So understand what's shocking. A Jew, an apostle, who knows that the Jews swear by Moses and his law, takes the gospel of a Greek who's not an apostle 
and calls it scripture and puts it on the level with Moses. Okay, now let me bring out the further significance. Notice that when Paul is writing this to Timothy, he doesn't have to tell Timothy where he's quoting from because he assumes that Timothy is so familiar with the scripture, he would know where this reference comes from. So he would know that he's quoting Moses. But that tells you at the time of 1 Timothy, Luke must have spread wide and far and had been already recognized as scripture because Paul doesn't say he's quoting Luke. He assumes Timothy knows that he's quoting Luke. You with me there? Just like Paul doesn't have to say he's quoting Moses because he knows his audience are so familiar with Moses, they'll recognize, oh, that's Moses. He doesn't have to tell Timothy, this is Luke, which means that Luke was had spread so far and wide so early on that people would recognize that this is Luke's gospel and therefore God's word. Right? Are you getting it thus far? Alan, you with me too? You're getting it? Now, someone can, should may ask, well, Matthew retains a similar saying of Jesus in Matthew 10.10. 10. Matthew 10.10. 10. Yes, Yahjil. If he is already familiar with the gospel of Luke, then he would also know that Luke wrote Acts, and to them, that would all be scripture. But now Matthew 10.10 10 has a similar saying of our Lord Jesus. But if you compare the Greek, Luke is not quoting Matthew 10.10. 10. Nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet stays, for the workman is worthy of his meat, his food. But look, Paul doesn't quote this form of Jesus as saying, so we know he's not quoting Matthew. So why would Paul quote Luke's gospel and not Matthew's version of the saying of Christ? Okay, let me repeat the question again. Why would Paul quote Luke's gospel instead of Matthew's version of the saying of Christ. Someone tell me. It does, first last. The only thing is that in Luke 10, you have the, the word God for. No, it was, Marion. The evidence shows that Matthew would have been written before Luke. No, not that Luke was earlier. Romans 10.9, you got it. You know why he quotes Luke's gospel, not Matthew? 2 Timothy 4.11 for your answer. But they would have also known Matthew, so that's not the answer. 2 Timothy 4.11 for your answer. No, not that Luke was written first, Renee. No, no, no. You guys are way off field. No, 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 no. The evidence suggests Luke is written after Mark and Matthew. 2 Timothy 4.11 for your answer. But Matthew's scripture too, because he's quoting Jesus, Zach Ali. That's not the answer. Here's the answer. Only Luke is with me. Bam. That's your answer. It makes sense that Paul in prison would quote Luke's gospel because Luke is with him. 2 Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me, but surprise, surprise. Take Mark, another gospel writer. And bring him with thee, for he's profitable to me for the ministry. Bam! So Luke knows Mark, who wrote Mark, which confirms that Mark would have been one of the sources that Luke used to write his gospel. Bam! Two gospel writers who know each other know Paul. Saw that 2 Timothy 4.11? So now it makes sense, right? He's going to quote Luke's gospel because Luke is with him. But Luke knows Mark and Mark knows Paul, which means if Mark wrote his gospel before Luke, then here you have an argument that one of the sources that Luke used would have been Mark's gospel, which means they're all affirming the writings of one another and there is no competition or anger that, hey, Luke, why are you writing a gospel? I wrote one. Hey, more power to you, Luke. Go ahead and write one too. More witnesses. You catching it? Let's look at 2 Timothy 4.11 again. You probably didn't catch it. 
One more time. 2 Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable for me for the ministry. Right? Now, I want you to write these passages down. We're not going to look at it. Okay? Acts 12, 12, 25. Okay? Acts 13, 5 and verse 13. And Acts 15, 36 to 41. Write those down. We're not going to look at them now. And Acts 12. Hold on. Acts 12, 12. Sorry. 12, verse 12 and 25. Okay? Acts 13, 5 and 13, 15, 36, 41. Luke mentions Mark and calls him John Mark and says that they used to meet in the mother and John Mark's mother's house. They used to have a house church. John Mark's mother used to have a house church that the apostles like Peter would attend. So this John Mark is believed to be the same Mark that wrote the gospel of Mark. Follow with me. In Acts 13, 5, 13, it says Paul and Barnabas took Mark on a journey, but then John Mark went back to Jerusalem. So in Acts 15, 36, 41, Barnabas wanted to bring Mark, but Paul said no because he left us on a journey. I don't want to take him with us. Barnabas and Paul got into a severe heated argument, and Barnabas says, you know what? If you're not going to take Mark, I'm not going with you. So they separated over Mark. So Barnabas went with Mark, and Paul went with others like Silas. Now here's a question. Why would Barnabas split with the apostle Paul over a nobody like Mark and divide with Paul over Mark? Now, Luke doesn't tell us, but Paul does. Colossians 4, verse 10. Colossians 4, verse 10. Watch here. Colossians 4, verse 10. Hey, Daryl, can you do me a favor, brother? You know I love you, man. Stop posting verses and bringing other passages. It's your impatience that's going to kill you. Colossians 4, verse 10. Watch why Barnabas would split with Paul over Mark. Here's your answer. Notice how one author provides details to help us understand what another writer says. You notice it? A writer will say one thing, and another writer will then give us details to make sense out of this statement found in another book. Watch here, Colossians 4.10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas. This is why Barnabas fought over Marcus, Mark, because Mark was his sister's son, his cousin, Anepsios, his nephew, his relative. You caught it? You see why Barnabas fought over Mark and split with Paul? Because we're told it's his relative, Anepsios. But now let's look at Colossians 4.10 and 14 to see who's with Paul while Paul is in prison. Because Paul is writing this in prison. Colossians 4.10 and 14. That was Colossians 4 verse 10. Now verse 14 together. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marco, Marcus, sister, son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. So notice, Mark and Luke are together with Paul during the time that Paul wrote this letter in prison. They're together. So two gospel writers know each other and are traveling with Paul. Philemon chapter 1 verse 24, even though it's only one chapter, 25 verses. Philemon chapter 1 verse 24. Is it making sense, guys? Philemon 1 24. Verse 24, pay attention. Another of Paul's prison epistles. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Notice the four men that he mentioned in Colossians. 
he mentions again in this letter, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The same four men mentioned in Colossians. So you see, Paul confirms Luke and Mark know each other. Luke has been with him, which is why Paul would quote Luke's gospel in 1 Timothy 5.18, because in 2 Timothy, we are told that Luke is with him while Paul is in prison. Make sense? Right? Now, you know, in the book of Acts and in Paul's letters, Paul mentions Silas, Silvanus, right? Like in Acts 16, if you read 19 all the way to 34, Paul and Silas, Silvanus, went to jail, correct? And then the jailer got saved, Acts 16, 19 to 34. Silas is there. So Silas is a companion of Paul, right? Okay. Now watch here. You want to get blown away? 1 Peter 5, 12 to 13. 1 Peter 5, 12 to 13. I think this is boring, you guys. It is breathtaking. I hope you're getting blown away. 1 Peter 5, 12 to 13. By Silvanus, bam. Silvanus is another form of the word Silas. Silas is short for Silvanus. So Peter's saying, by Silas, Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly. Did you see what Peter said? Silas, help me write my letter to you. Silas, that Silvanus is Silas. Silas is Silvanus. I've written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. Notice verse 13. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, as do Marcus, my son. Wow. So Mark is with Peter and Silas. Silas was with Paul. Mark was with Paul. Luke was with Mark and Paul. They all know each other. Do you catch it before I move on? Because that's the Greek form of his name, Marcus, and he would have had more than one name. And that's common, like Simon Peter, right? Everyone with me there? Peter says, Silas wrote this letter for me. Mark, my son, greets you. So Mark is with me and Silas is with me. Silas who knew Paul. And then Paul in his letter says, Mark and Luke are with me. And Paul quotes Luke's gospel of scripture and puts on a level Moses. <laughs> because Peter didn't write it, Mark did. So they want to attribute the gospel to the one who actually wrote it. Is that clear before I move on? So I'm going slow because I want it to sink in. It's not so much he was a scribe for Peter, Romans 10, 9. He wrote the gospel from all those years of he hearing Peter preach. So it doesn't mean he wrote it with Peter being there. He could have written after Peter was martyred. Or he could have written when Peter was alive. But the early church wanted to give the name of the one who actually wrote that gospel. Is that clear? Yes, it's believed he's the first gospel written, but we don't have any conclusive irrefutable proof that it was. But I do accept the fact that Mark is first, then Matthew and Luke and Acts. But can I conclusively prove it? Perhaps not. Right? But if Mark is first and Matthew and Luke is already circulating a scripture in the 60s, because we believe Paul wrote first and second Timothy and Titus before he was martyred around 65 to 68 AD, then that proves what the internal evidence shows that Luke and Acts were compiled and composed and written before 62 AD. Why 62 AD? Why do we know that? How do we know Luke and Acts was done by 62 AD? 
because Acts ends with Paul's house arrest in Rome before his audience with Caesar. Now, let me explain to you this significance. The internal evidence of Acts shows strongly Acts was written around 62 AD because Acts end with Paul in house arrest in Rome before his audience with Caesar. Now, why is that significant? Because in Luke, Luke mentions the martyrdom of Stephen. He mentions the martyrdom of James, John's brother in Acts 12. But he doesn't mention the martyrdom of James, the brother of Christ, nor does he mention Paul's audience before Caesar or Paul being killed, nor does he mention Peter being killed, which church history assigns to the date of 62 to 68 AD. The early church assigns the martyrdom of James, the Lord's brother, on 62 AD, Peter on 64, 65, and Paul around 65, 68. And Luke doesn't mention the destruction of Jerusalem. Why is that significant? Because three of the main characters in Acts are Peter, James, the Lord's brother, and Paul, and Jerusalem. If Luke is written after James, the Lord's brother, was killed, after Peter was killed, after Paul was killed, after the temple was destroyed, we you would think he mentioned those events because they're quite significant. When Luke mentions the death of Stephen, who's not as significant, and James, the brother of John, none of which he mentions, he ends it with Paul still under house arrest, which strongly supports Luke is written around 62 AD before the death of James, the Lord's brother. Well, if Acts is written before 62 AD, Luke is earlier. That means Luke is written around 60 AD, which means Matthew must be earlier and Mark earlier still. So you can make a strong case internally that Mark, Matthew, Luke, and Acts are in anywhere from the 40s to 62 AD. Acts wasn't even written at the end of Paul's trial, Romans 10, 9. He's still under house arrest. He hasn't seen Caesar yet. He's waiting, and he ends it there. Don't you think that Luke would have mentioned Paul's audience with Caesar and the result, whether he was set free or not? Why does he end with Paul still under house arrest in Rome Waiting to see Caesar, because that means it didn't happen yet, which means why he doesn't mention it. So now you can make a strong case internally. Acts is written around 62 AD. That means Luke is earlier, maybe in the late 50s, early 60s, before Acts. And then Matthew is before Luke, so you can push him in the 50s, and Mark even earlier. So you can make a strong case. Mark, Matthew, Luke, and Acts were written from the 40s to 62 at the very latest. Right? Everyone with me there? Or did I confuse you? Let alone Luke writing as an eyewitness to some of these events. Are you aware that Luke in the book of Acts writes from an eyewitness perspective, claiming to have been there, seeing some of the miracles that Paul performed, and meeting James, the Lord's brother. Let me prove that to you. Let's go to Acts 16, 14 to 18. Acts 16, 14 to 18. I think I'm going to just do Sola Scriptura part one and then have to do part two tomorrow. Acts 16, 14, 18. One means yes, Malachi. That's my code word. One means yes, we get it. Two means no, we don't. But you can say yes or no. But read Acts 16, 14 to 18. Read. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller. Yes, I'm Sam Shimon. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us. Did you catch what Luke said? Heard us. I was there. Heard us, me included, okay, whose art, heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Now notice 15. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, 
me included, I was there, saying, if you have judged, pay attention, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and abide there. And she constrained us, me too. Watch here. Luke is now writing as an eyewitness to this exorcism. Acts 16, 16 to 18. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, as we went to prayer, I went to pray with Paul and the rest. I was there. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us. I was there. I saw this demon-possessed girl, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God. Notice that this woman is testifying by the prompting of this evil spirit. Paul and Luke and the rest are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now notice verse 18. And this did she many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Did you see what Luke just claimed to be? Did you see what Luke just claimed to be? And I witness to this event. I was there. I was with Paul and the rest, and I saw it. Now notice who also Luke saw. Acts 21, 18 and 20. Who also did Luke see? Acts 21, 18 to 20. Acts 21, 18 to 20. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James. This is in Jerusalem. Wait, Luke was there with Paul and others to see James, the Lord's brother? And all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Wow. Luke, you're saying you were with Paul when you made a journey to Jerusalem to meet James, the Lord's brother? Yep. You met James, the Lord's brother? Yes. So you met the eyewitnesses to Christ who walked with Christ, talked with Christ, sat with Christ, ate with Christ? Yep, I met them. You with me there? So Luke met the very eyewitnesses of Jesus who saw the physical, historical Jesus on earth and who saw the physical Jesus raised from the dead. Luke met them, one of whom was James, the Lord's brother. Now we can appreciate Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Let's appreciate it even more. Exactly, Brother Bass. Have no doubt your Bible is based on accurate eyewitness testimony, historical facts, not fiction, by men who were there and knew the men who knew Jesus. Your faith is solid beyond understanding. Luke 1, verses 1 and 4. Now it makes sense what Luke says. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in an order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us. See, I'm one of those that received this. Delivered unto us, me included, from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So I met the eyewitnesses. And they delivered to me what I'm about to write to you, ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had <clears throat> perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order. Most excellent Theophilus. See, I saw the eyewitnesses, the preachers of the word, and they delivered to me this that I'm writing for you, Theophilus, so that in verse 4, that thou mightest know the certainty, have no doubt, all of these things are true and happen. They're historical facts, wherein thou hast been instructed. 
You see? Making sense? So now if you're wondering, how did Luke know what Mary was thinking in her heart in Luke 1 and Luke 2 when the angel Gabriel announced to her the birth of Christ and when she saw Jesus say things and do things? Because Luke would have either interviewed her or at the very least James, the Lord's brother, who was raised with Jesus. Is that clear? You see how solid your faith is? One quality Paul Bullis they had you don't have. They had that you don't. They wouldn't get bounced as you're about to get bounced for asking me a question not related to the topic. But now let's go to Acts 1, 1 to 5. Notice he's writing to Theophilus, right? He's saying most excellent Theophilus. Acts 1, verses 1 to 5. Acts 1, verses 1 to 5. Why should he, Romans 10, 9? Why should he tell you every single second minute of Jesus' earthly existence? Should he also told you what time Jesus took a bath and what he ate for breakfast? Why should he tell you? I mean, I'll be honest with you, brother. I don't mean to be disrespectful. A silly, stupid question because what he told you is enough for you to study and and busy yourself with why are you worried about things he didn't say when the things he did say are more than enough for you to handle why are you guys blocking no 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 rick manila and susan they're kosher and whoever's the they're okay they're laughing not at me but with me okay acts one one of five that luke wrote acts the Luke who wrote Luke wrote also wrote Acts. Pay attention, Acts 1, 1 of 5. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus. Notice he's writing to Theophilus again and reminds him of what he wrote formerly. The former treaties, the former book that I wrote, O Theophilus, showing you it's the same author. Luke 1 is written to Theophilus. Acts is written to Theophilus. And in Acts, he mentions see Theophilus, the former book that I wrote. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus. In fact, post it again. Acts 1, 1 of 5. Acts 1, 1 of 5. The questions that some of you ask, it has no relevance to the topic. Are you noticing yourself you can't stay focused? Dude, discipline. Alpha Omega, you came too late. I already answered the question. You came too late. Don't ask me the question. Go back and listen. I start this by showing that Paul quotes Luke's gospel as scripture. And scripture is produced by the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 1 of 5. This is what happens when you come late, brother. You come late again, you're going to have to repent, face the east, and burn some candles. Acts 1, 1 of 5. Let's read. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Notice he's saying, I wrote to you formally, and we know what book that is, Luke, because in Luke 1, he mentions Theophilus. And that book, I focused on all that Jesus did until when? Until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, right? Now notice verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. So Theophilus. I'm writing down to you what I heard the eyewitnesses who saw Jesus alive for 40 days. They saw him alive. I heard from them. And so now I'm showing you what they saw and the infallible proofs that Jesus gave to them, convincing them beyond any doubt he's alive, he's risen, he's not dead. Infallible proofs, proofs that can't be refuted. You seeing that, verse 3? whom he also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Notice 4 and 5. 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, commanding them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now notice what Luke is saying. 
Let, notice what Luke is saying. Theophilus, I wrote two treatises. The former one that I wrote to you was all about Jesus, what he did, what he said, until he was taken to heaven. But before he's taken to heaven, he appeared alive for 40 days to the apostles, to the eyewitnesses, and provided infallible proofs, irrefutable proofs. He's alive. He's not dead. These are the eyewitnesses that shared with me the facts that I'm now presenting to you. Are you with me there? Are you with me what, what Luke is saying? So how do we know that the same author that wrote Luke wrote Acts? Because in Luke and Acts, it's written to the same person, Theophilus. Luke 1, it's to Theophilus. Acts 1, it's to Theophilus, showing it's the same author. Now, let's unpack it further. Acts 1, Acts 1, I want you to read verses 9 to 12. Acts 1, verses 9 to 12. Hold on. Acts 1, verse 9 to 12. Read with me. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, ten two men stood by them in white apparel. Now notice 11 and 12. Watch here. Which also said, Ye men of Gal Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. Now let me unpack what you just read. Luke said, the eyewitnesses who testified to me saw Jesus physically ascend from the Mount of Olives. Because they returned from the Mount of Olives. So here's a group of eyewitnesses. And you read it here. Who Jesus is speaking to physically in his physical glorified body. And then they see that physical body ascend before their eyes. Enter a cloud and disappear. And this is how they're looking. That's why the, the angels say, men of Galilee, why are you gazing? Because this is how they're looking. You understand? He just blew their mind away. Because here you are seeing a human being in a physical body ascend before your eyes, enters a cloud, disappears. You're not going to be, oh, okay, that's interesting. Let's go have tea. You're going to be like this. And so what did the angel say to them? Why are you gazing intently? He's going to come back. Now you understand the sadness and the happiness. Let me tell you the sadness. This would be the last time, and I'm, again, I'm being moved in my spirit, and I said I'm not going to cry, right? This would be the last time they would see Jesus physically for a while. They would not have him physically, right? But the gladness knowing he's alive, he's in heaven, and death will never separate us from him because death will be the door we enter to see him again in his physical body. And eventually he will return to the earth physically because the way he left is the way he'll return. He left from the Mount of Olives, he'll return to the Mount of Olives. But can you imagine? There's a little sadness there, isn't it? Man. I won't see him physically and touch him physically and kiss him physically for a while. But you know what? That's okay. I know he's alive. I know he's in heaven. And physically he's there on the throne. And I will see him again and he'll return to the earth. Right? You want me there? But now, how does this tie in with Luke? Luke. Now let's read 13 to 14. 13 to 14. 
So Jesus left physically from the Mount of Olives in a cloud. He returned to a cloud and descended from the cloud physically to the Mount of Olives. Now watch 13 to 14. And when they were coming, they went up into an upper room. So they returned, went to an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John, the brothers, and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotes, Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Exactly, Andy Garcia. Did you catch who's also there waiting for the Holy Spirit to be poured out from Jesus in heaven? The mother of our Lord and his brothers. Do you see it? Verse 14. The mother of our Lord and his brothers are there waiting for Jesus to pour out the Spirit upon them from heaven. Okay, you there? What does that mean? That means James, the Lord's brother, was there, right? James, the Lord's brother, saw Jesus physically leave the Mount of Olives and go to heaven, right? Right? Are you, you, you with me there? James, the Lord's brother, would have been there seeing Jesus physically ascend into a cloud into heaven. He would have been an eyewitness and have seen that, right? And that James, the Lord's brother, was an eyewitness to the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. <clears throat> He had died long before Jesus' ministry, death, and resurrection, Brother Bass. So Joseph had, had died. That's why no mention of him. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. Yes, Romans 10, 9. When Jesus appeared to him, he became a Christian. Here you go. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. Read. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. And that he was seen, Jesus was seen alive of James, then of all the apostles. Did you catch it? The Lord Jesus made a special appearance to James, his brother. Now, if you want to say it's his cousin, that's okay. We're not going to get into that debate, right? So James, the Lord's brother, saw Jesus alive. Jesus appeared to him. And James, the Lord's brother, brother would have been there seeing Jesus physically take off from the Mount of Olives, right? Are you with me there? Making sense? Now, why is that significant? Let's go back to Acts 21, 18. You see why I'm taking time? We're going to go back to tw Acts 21, 18. Watch here. Acts 21, 18. And the day following Paul went in with us unto James. Bam, let it sink in. I was there with Paul and others. We saw James. Luke, which James did you see? The Lord's brother. You mean the one who saw Jesus physically alive? Yes. You mean the one that you mentioned happened to be there? Who saw Jesus physically take off in a cloud from the Mount of Olives? Yes. You met him and I witnessed to these events? Yes. So you're telling me, you're writing down eyewitness testimony from the people who saw him alive? Yes. Who saw him physically take off into a cloud into heaven? Yes. My information is based on solid facts. I have no doubt. Did it sink in? Did, is it sinking in? So can imagine Luke looking at James saying, wait, 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 wait. You saw him physically alive? Yeah. Physically in that body now glorified and destructible? Yes. You touch? Yeah. Then you saw him physically ascend before your eyes? Man, Luke, if you had only been there. And then you saw him in a cloud and disappear? It was the most amazing sight. And you know what, Luke? You know what that means? Jesus is now alive in heaven on the throne with the Father in that physical body that I touched and I saw take off before my eyes. And you saw it? Yes, I did. Wow. You catch it now? So that's why he says, have no doubt about 
the absolute certainty of the things I'm writing. I saw the people who saw Jesus physically alive and physically ascend. Lord bless you, friends. So make sure you listen to the entire session. I'm almost done. Yes, he did. I would. I, he would. If Luke was with Mark, and Mark had written his gospel, then obviously Luke is going to say, "Hey, Mark, can I use your gospel to write out my account?" Sure, go ahead, brother. This is God's revelation. Use it for the glory of Christ. Of course, he would have used Mark. Now, Q, Quella, that's debatable because there are scholars who say this source called Q doesn't exist because what we call Q is actually Matthew, material found in Matthew that Luke would have used. Okay, so is that clear now? Everyone got it? God bless you too, Travis. So you see Luke is called Scripture by Paul because Luke was with him, and Luke is not a Jew. He's not an apostle. He's a Greek. A physician and Luke gospel is placed with Moses where Paul calls it scripture and Luke and Acts are based on eyewitness testimony irrefutable facts historical facts that took place so that in 2 Timothy 3 when Paul says all scripture is God breathed is there any doubt that Paul is not simply limiting that phrase to the Old Testament but he's including all the scriptures that God produced up until the time of Paul's writing, like Luke's gospel. How much time, Ralph? Have I been streaming? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a part two tomorrow. Okay? A part two because it's already over an hour and a half. But I'm going to give you a few more references to prove to you that when Paul says all scriptures God breathed, he's not limiting it to the Old Testament. He also has in mind all the writings that God would breathe out and produce by the Spirit, including the books that became part of the New Testament, like Luke's gospel and Paul's letters. So I'm going to give you now a few more verses to show that when Paul wrote 2 Timothy 3, all scriptures God breathed, he has in mind Luke's gospel, even Mark's writing because Mark is with him. If Mark had written his gospel, and evidence shows he did, and Paul's own writings as scripture. Because the church says he's Greek. Why, well, you want to make him Swahili? More power to you. Okay? 2 Corinthians 13, verse 3 and 10. Did Paul think he was writing scripture? 2 Corinthians 13, 3 and 10. Did Paul think he was writing scripture? Let's see. Okay. Notice what Paul says. 2 Corinthians 13, 3 and 10. Since ye seek proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak but is mighty in you. So you want proof that it's Christ who's speaking through me, giving you these commands? 2 Corinthians 13, verse 10. Therefore, I write these things. I write these things being absent. Lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, not to destruction. Destruction. So notice what Paul is saying. The things I say, the things I write, is by the authority of Christ, by Christ speaking through me. So I'm preaching the words of Christ, writing down the words of Christ, by the authority of Christ, by inspiration of Christ. Right? 1 Corinthians 2.13. 1 Corinthians 2.13. God bless you, life of life. I'm almost done anyway. Make sure you hear, hear the rest of it later. 1 Corinthians 2.13. Which things also we speak? The things I speak to you, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth. I'm not speaking to you words that a man taught me, but which the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit teacheth. I'm teaching you the wisdom that the Holy Spirit has taught me, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So Paul thinks that he's teaching us the wisdom taught to him by the Holy Spirit, giving commands that the Lord Jesus is giving through him because Christ is speaking through him as Christ's mouthpiece. Do you see it? Do you see it there?
1 Corinthians 14, 37 to 38. 1 Corinthians 14, 37 to 38. Watch here. Pay attention to what Paul thinks about his letters. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, 38. If any man think himself to be a prophet. Now, if you think you're a prophet, speaking by the spirit, watch, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commands of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Do you see what he just said? See what he just said? If you're a prophet and the spirit is talking to you, then you're going to know that I'm writing God's commands. These are not my commands, the commands of the Lord. So you better accept them. Because a true prophet who's speaking by the Spirit that's teaching me will recognize these are commands that the Lord gave me. Are you seeing it? First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Watch here. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, when you heard us preach the word of God, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You see what he said? The words I speak, you recognize it wasn't simply human words, words from a human being, but you recognize that I was preaching the word of God to you. You saw it for what it is. The word of God, not just the mere words of men, but the word of God communicated through human language. And that word of God is now working powerful in you to change you for the glory of Christ. You caught it? So it's not merely human words. It's the very word of God communicated through human language. And you recognize it for what it is. And because you recognize it for what it is, that word is now changing you. Because God's word isn't some, something you simply hear. God's word has power to change you for Christ. It actually works in you to change you. Who does Paul think he is? Paul, who do you think you are? That you're claiming that the words you speak and what you write it's the very word of God, the word that Christ is speaking through you with wisdom taught to you by the Spirit. Man, it sounds like you think you're inspired. What about 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 2? First Thessalonians 4 verse 2. Watch here. For you know what commands we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. Bam. Jesus told me to give you these commands. Jesus told me to write these commands. 1 Thessalonians 4, 8. Yep. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 8. He therefore that despiseth, meaning whoever rejects this command that I'm writing, despiseth not men. You're not despising me, but you're despising God who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. So if you despise my instruction here, it's not me you're despising. You're despising God. See that? And then like the Old Testament is supposed to be read publicly by believers, 1 Thessalonians 5.27. 1 Thessalonians 5.27. Exactly, first and last. A true prophet recognized that he's writing the commands of the Lord with wisdom by the Holy Spirit. I charge you, say, I command you before God, by the Lord, that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Paul, what do you think your writing is? That it has to be read. You mean Christians have to read your writing? Who do you think you are, man? You caught it there? Ephesians 3, verses 3 and 5. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3, 4, and 5. Yep, he was. He's my hero, Paul. I probably can be like him. 
Ephesians 3, verses 3 to 5. Watch here. How that by revelation, see, this was given to me by revelation. He made known unto me a revelation, the mystery. As I wrote, so I'm writing you the mystery that God gave to me by revelation, a foreign few words, whereby when you read, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Bam, did you catch it? I'm writing to you this mystery that God revealed to me, a mystery that God revealed to me and the other holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. Right? Lord willing, in part two, I'm going to show more verses, but I want to sum up for today because I'm going to have to end it. It's over, already over an hour and 40 minutes. Go back to 2 Timothy 3, 16. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3, 16. Daryl, uh, it's not how many years I studied. Early on, I realized that God had gifted me to be able to recall scriptures without having notes. So he gets the glory, all glory to him. May he destroy my pride and enable me to understand the implication of these passages. It's not something I earned or worked for. It was the gift of his grace to make it easier for me to teach for his glory. So this is all from memory. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may he get the glory. 2 Timothy 3.16. Now notice here. Let's revisit this passage and sum it up. Okay, let's read it. 2 Timothy 3.16. Let's read it again. Read with me. All scripture is given inspiration of God. Now, in light of all these letters that Paul wrote, 2 Timothy is believed to be the last letter he wrote before he was killed for Christ. Since in all these letters, Paul says, I'm writing to you the commands of Christ. I'm writing to you the mystery revealed to me by God, which you revealed by the Holy Spirit to the other holy apostles and prophets. Christ is speaking through me. Christ gave me authority to issue these commands, right? You accepted this word that I preach, not as the word of men, but as the word of God. Over and over and over again, Paul goes out of his way to say, the things I write, the things I speak, are taught to me with wisdom from the Holy Spirit, revealed to me by the Holy Spirit, commands that Jesus gave me to give to you because Christ is speaking through me, you're going to tell me that when he then writes 2 Timothy 3.16 and says all scripture is breathed out by God, Paul wasn't including his own letters? So by the time he gets to 2 Timothy 3.16, all these other letters where he goes out of his way to say, I'm writing the revelation given to me by the Spirit, teaching you with the wisdom given to me by the Spirit, giving you commands that the Lord Jesus gave to me as he speaks through me. So all scriptures God breathed doesn't include his writings. Is that what you want me to believe? And then in 1 Timothy 5.18, when he quotes Luke 10.7 and calls it scripture, Paul doesn't have in mind Luke's gospel as scripture breathed out by God. Seriously? In other words, any time a Roman Catholic or Orthodox says 2 Timothy 3.16 is only about the Old Testament, correct him or her. No, it isn't. Paul has in mind every scripture that God would produce, and he has in mind all the scriptures that God produced up until the time of his writing, including his own letters and Luke's gospel. Right? So all scripture is God breathed does include all of the Bible, even the New Testament, because Paul is not limiting it to a certain set of books, but he has in mind every scripture that has been produced and will be produced, preserved by God for the church. Right? So this objection is easily refuted, right? But let me now put the icing on the cake. Let's agree for argument's sake. Let's agree for argument's sake. Paul is referring to the Old Testament. You with me there? 
Let's agree for argument's sake that when Paul says all scriptures God breathed, he's talking about the Old Testament because those are the scriptures that Timothy knew. Understand the implication. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. This too doesn't prove their position. It proves sola scriptura. It actually backfires. Let me show you why. Let me show you how it actually backfires and proves this teaches sola scriptura. Are you ready? Let's go to 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. From child he would have known the Old Testament. The Old Testament are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So the Old Testament were produced to give you wisdom to know who Jesus is and to believe in him for salvation. All scripture, all of the Old Testament is given by inspiration of God. And the Old Testament is profitable for teaching, to teach you what you're supposed to believe, to rebuke you when you need to be rebuked, to correct you when you're wrong, and to instruct you how to live a righteous life. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay, now, folks, listen to me. If the Old Testament is sufficient to tell you about who Jesus is and how to get saved by faith in Jesus, and the Old Testament is sufficient to make you complete for every good work, so that any and every good work you need to know is in the Old Testament, and all the wisdom you need to have to know who Jesus is and be saved by faith in him. How much more is the Bible now sufficient with the New Testament? If the Old Testament was sufficient to get you saved and teach you everything you need to know in order to live a holy life, how much more sufficient is the Bible now with the 27 books of the New Testament? That means the Bible now has become super sufficient. Meaning you don't need anything but the Bible because it's now super sufficient. You see how it backfires? How does this refute Sola Scriptura when it proves if the Old Testament was sufficient, now when you add the New Testament, it becomes even more sufficient, super sufficient, showing all you need is Scripture. How does that refute Sola Scriptura? Can you help me understand? It doesn't, doesn't it? Right? Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to have to do part two of this tomorrow, God willing, around 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Christian Standard Time. Um, Christian Standard Time. 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time. 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. So tune in, invite people. Hit the like button, watch this again, take notes, pass it to others so they can learn why we affirm Sola Scriptura for the glory of God and see the amazing consistency, accuracy, historical reliability of the Bible, right? Showing it's truly the Word of God, historically accurate, and that this, this historical Jesus is the Jesus of the Bible, who is God in the flesh, who is alive in heaven, and who will return. Have no doubt, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. He is Yahovah in the flesh to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, please pray and fast for me. These 60 days, I need God to deliver me from the courts, set me free and my daughters free, provide for me, and send me to a new state in October. Pray for that. Lord, release me to go to the state in October and start a new life. Please pray. I need a miracle. Christ is alive. He's more real we can imagine and loves us. Amen. We love you, Lord Jesus. And tomorrow, Sola Scriptura Part 2. Take care. Lord bless. bless. Stay with Jesus as Jesus remains with you and will never leave nor forsake you. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you.